Imagine being sentenced to 100 years in prison and walking out in under five minutes. No aging, no time to go insane from isolation, no decades lost to the calendar. Just a moment of fear, darkness, and then suddenly, freedom. This is the terrifying promise of time-locked prisons, facilities that use artificial time acceleration to compress punishment into fractions of real-world time. They sound like science fiction, but the science behind them is quietly moving from theory to laboratory reality. Today, we're exploring what time-locked prisons are, how they could work, why governments might want them, and why they might become the most controversial technology in human history. To understand time-locked prisons, we first have to understand time itself. From Einstein's theory of relativity, we already know time is not constant. It moves differently depending on speed and gravity. Astronauts on the International Space Station age just a tiny fraction slower than people on Earth. That's real, measurable time dilation. Now imagine not a tiny fraction, but millions of times faster or slower. If a human brain could be placed inside a region where time is accelerated dramatically, years of experience could unfold in moments of outside world time. This is the fundamental concept behind time-locked incarceration. You don't change the length of the punishment. You change the speed at which the prisoner experiences it. In early theoretical models, this could be achieved through extreme gravitational fields, quantum time fields, or simulated neural time acceleration. Realistically, the first versions wouldn't bend space-time itself. They would instead manipulate the brain's perception of time through neural implants, artificial consciousness environments, and hyper-accelerated virtual realities. A prisoner might be placed into a controlled digital environment where their mind runs hundreds of thousands of times faster than normal. One real-world minute could equal several years of perceived time inside the system. From the outside, the inmate enters the chamber, the system activates, and within moments they exit, having mentally lived through decades of incarceration. Their body hasn't aged, but their mind has experienced the full psychological weight of their sentence. This instantly rewrites everything we think we know about justice, punishment, rehabilitation, and human rights. Supporters of time-locked prisons argue that this could solve many of the world's deepest criminal justice problems. Overcrowded prisons would become obsolete almost overnight. Governments would save trillions in food, housing, medical care, and security costs. Violent offenders would no longer spend decades dangerous to staff and other inmates. Restitution could happen faster. Victims would see justice served almost immediately. Instead of a trial followed by a lifetime of imprisonment, sentencing could be followed by instant completion of punishment. There's also the argument of reduced societal harm. Traditional prisons remove people from society for long periods, often producing deeper criminal behavior through exposure to violence, gangs, and institutional trauma. Time-locked prisons would remove physical danger almost entirely. A prisoner would never interact physically with other prisoners. No riots, no smuggling, no assault of guards. The world outside continues normally, while punishment happens in a sealed temporal microcosm. Another powerful argument is rehabilitation. In theory, a person could undergo decades of structured therapy, education, psychological treatment, and behavioral reform inside accelerated time. When they return, only minutes or hours have passed on the outside, but they may have completed university-level education, trauma treatment, emotional conditioning, and moral rehabilitation equivalent to a lifetime. Instead of releasing hardened criminals after decades of social decay, society could potentially release reformed individuals who are mentally transformed. But now comes the darker side. Because what happens when punishment no longer costs society time, but only technology? The barrier to extreme sentencing collapses. If a government can assign a billion years of subjective punishment with no physical cost, how do we prevent sentencing inflation? Would courts begin issuing one million year sentences as symbolic justice? At that point, punishment becomes infinite in scale, restrained only by political will. Then there's the psychological horror. The human mind evolved for decades, 
not centuries or millennia of continuous experience without anatomical aging. Even if the body doesn't break down, the brain still experiences suffering. Loneliness, regret, fear, and despair could compound over thousands of subjective years. Insanity becomes almost guaranteed without constant psychological stabilization. And even with therapy programs, the philosophical question remains. Is inflicting centuries of suffering in minutes ethically equivalent to doing it slowly over time? Or worse, because there's no chance for perspective, forgiveness, or natural emotional decay. One of the most disturbing possibilities is memory overload. The human brain has biological limits. If a prisoner lives 200 subjective years inside a time-accelerated system, where do all those memories go? Would the system periodically erase memory segments? If so, does that reduce the punishment? Or does it make it worse by trapping the person in a loop of suffering with no chance of mental resolution? If memories are preserved, could the person return psychologically shattered, unable to function in real society, despite their body being young? And what about consent? In some proposals, time-locked sentencing could be optional. A defendant could choose between a traditional 20-year physical prison term or a time-locked equivalent served in 20 minutes of external time. At first glance, almost everyone would choose the time-locked option. But is that truly informed consent when the experience is fundamentally unknowable? Can a human accurately grasp what it means to live 20 years in psychological isolation, compressed into a single physical moment? Then comes the political danger. Authoritarian regimes would not be able to resist this technology. Imagine dissidents being disappeared into time-locked systems for subjective lifetimes and returned psychologically destroyed in public as warnings. Even worse, imagine permanent time loops used for interrogation, punishment, or forced conditioning. If time can be manipulated, torture becomes scalable beyond any historical precedent. Some projections suggest that early versions of this technology won't be used for criminals at all, but for training. Military simulations, emergency response training, astronaut preparation, and deep therapy could all benefit from accelerated subjective time. A pilot could experience hundreds of missions in minutes. A trauma patient could process years of therapy in a single session. The prison use might come later, once the ethical boundaries erode. Another terrifying possibility is that time-locked prisons may not be simulation-based at all. Advanced physics models suggest that contained regions of altered time flow could one day be engineered through extreme quantum vacuum manipulation or artificial gravity wells. In such a case, the prisoner's body itself would experience time dilation, not just their perception. From their perspective, decades pass normally. From the outside, moments pass. This removes the buffer of virtual control. Physical aging would occur. Muscles would atrophy according to subjective time. If the system fails, entire lifetimes could be lost instantly. Now consider legal responsibility. If a person commits a crime at age 20, serves 50 subjective years inside a time-locked system, and exits at biological age 20, are they legally a 70-year-old individual with full adult life experience? Or are they still legally the same age they entered? Do they qualify for senior rights? For pension? For psychological disability? The legal system would be completely unprepared for these paradoxes. There is also the issue of identity drift. After decades of accelerated experience, a person is no longer the same psychological individual who committed the crime. Their values, beliefs, emotional structures, and worldview may be entirely different. Is it still just to punish them for the actions of a person they barely recognize as themselves? In ordinary prison, time changes people gradually alongside society. In time-locked prisons, the person changes while society stands still. Some philosophers argue that this creates punishment without social reintegration. In traditional incarceration, the prisoner and society both age together. Cultural trends, technology, and norms evolve for everyone at the same pace. With time-locking, society barely changes while the prisoner leaps across decades of internal transformation. They return not from another time period, but from another existential scale of life experience. One proposed safeguard is real-time oversight. 
human observers monitoring internal virtual environments and psychological metrics continuously. But this introduces another moral burden. Guards would essentially be watching entire lifetimes of suffering unfold at accelerated speed. A single work shift could involve observing years of a person's mental life collapse and rebuild repeatedly. What does that do to the guards? Another safeguard is time cap regulation. International law might limit time-locked sentences to specific maximum subjective durations, such as 10 or 20 years. But history shows us that when nations acquire powerful tools of control, limits are often quietly exceeded in the name of security. There is also a troubling economic angle. Private corporations could operate time-locked facilities under government contracts. Profit would be generated not per year of physical housing, but per unit of subjective time served. That creates a grotesque incentive structure where suffering itself becomes a scalable commodity. If it costs almost nothing to add another subjective decade to a sentence, profit motives might push towards ever longer punishment cycles. And then there's the question of mistake. In our current justice system, wrongful convictions are tragic, but sometimes reversible. Innocent people can be released after years when new evidence emerges. But what if someone is wrongly time-locked for 80 subjective years, and then exonerated five minutes later in real time? From the outside, the error is brief. From the inside, an entire life was stolen. Reparations become meaningless. No compensation can restore lost decades of consciousness. The technology also forces us to confront what punishment is actually supposed to accomplish. Is punishment meant to deter, to reform, to isolate, or to morally balance harm? If deterrence depends on public fear, will people fear a punishment that appears to last only minutes in real time? Or will public understanding of subjective time make the fear exponentially greater? The psychology of deterrence could be completely reversed. Some theorists propose a radical alternative use, restorative time locking. Instead of isolating the offender, the system could place them into simulated lived experiences of their victims' lives. They would experience the emotional and psychological impact of the harm they caused from the victim's perspective across subjective years. The goal would no longer be suffering for its own sake, but deep moral rehabilitation through experiential empathy. Whether this would reform or completely psychologically destroy a person is an open question. Governments are not the only players here. Hackers, black market operators, and extremist groups would be obsessed with time-locked technology. Illegal versions could be used for private punishment, forced reprogramming, or even underground time entertainment, where people pay to live thousands of years of artificial fantasy in a few physical hours. A new form of time tourism could emerge, entire synthetic lifetimes rented like movies. Religious institutions would also be divided. Some would condemn time-locked punishment as a violation of divine natural time. Others might embrace it as a tool for accelerated spiritual purification. Entire new theologies would emerge around the idea of compressed lifetimes, artificial purgatory, and subjective eternity. And then we reach the most unsettling question of all. If time-locked prisons become real, what happens when they are applied not only to criminals, but to the rest of society? What happens when they are used for labor, training, or even social control? A worker could be paid for 40 years of experience compressed into one week. A child could be educated across multiple lifetimes before adulthood. A population could be conditioned in secret while only minutes pass in the physical world. At that point, the distinction between prison, school, therapy, and social engineering dissolves. Time itself becomes infrastructure. Whoever controls it controls human development at a scale never seen before. We are not there yet. Today, we only have fragments of the necessary technology. Early brain-computer interfaces, neural stimulation, artificial intelligence, immersive virtual environments, and theoretical physics models of time manipulation. But history shows that when the ingredients exist separately, they do not stay separate for long. The path from laboratory experiment to societal transformation is often much shorter than we expect. 
Time-locked prisons force us to confront a final, chilling possibility, that the most powerful prison is not one made of steel and stone, but one made of altered time. A prison where the bars are not walls, but seconds. Where escape is not blocked by locks, but by the speed of your own consciousness. If such a system is ever built, humanity will be forced to decide whether justice should still be measured in years or in fractions of a heartbeat. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that like button, drop a comment to share your thoughts, and subscribe so you don't miss any of our future uploads. Your support helps this channel grow. Thank you for watching.